let's look together in Philippians chapter 4, beginning in verse 10. Let's talk about the secret of contentment. Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse 10. Paul says, I rejoiced greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things in Christ. Now, maybe you have learned that verse like I did. I can do all things through Christ. But actually, what Paul wrote was, I can do all things in in Christ, and it really does make a difference. Through Christ is a means, but in Christ is a state of being. I can do all things in Christ who gives me strength. You know, from the very beginning, the quest for contentment has been the holy grail in every generation. Contentment was the ultimate quest of the Stoic philosophers of ancient Greece right up to Paul's day. For the the Stoics, contentment was the highest virtue that anybody could attain. In the 16th century, Jeremiah Burroughs called contentment the rarest jewel of human experience. Maybe it's because bound up in the serpent's original lie and in mankind's original sin was an unholy discontentment. You might remember that God provided Adam with a vast garden full of a variety of trees, all of them good for food. And God said to Adam, you can eat the fruit of any tree in this garden except just one. Along came the serpent and he aroused unholy discontentment in Adam and Eve's hearts. Why is God holding out on you. If God really loves you, why is he withholding the very best from you? If he really loves you, why is he withholding from you something that appeals to you, something that would make you happy, something that would make you fulfilled and complete? Mankind believed the lie and disobeyed God, and we have wrestled with unholy discontentment ever since. Paul says in Romans 1 that in our fallen state, we are by nature ungrateful to God and unthankful. If you think about our consumer-driven culture today, it thrives on constantly stirring up discontentment. Marketing aims to make you perpetually discontent so that you'll go out there and buy more stuff. You need this. This will make you happy. This will make you better. This will make you more of a man. This will make you more of a woman. The entertainment industry relies on your perpetual discontentment so they can keep you coming back for more. Without question, we are the most peaceful, prosperous, egalitarian culture ever in the history of the world And yet, look at the symptoms of our discontentment. Look at our consumer debt. Do you know that the average American dies leaving behind $62,000 in debt? That's a lot of debt for a dead person. (laughs) The average household has $16,000 in credit card debt, $140,000 in overall debt. We're buying stuff to satisfy our discontentment and the debt is killing us. Look at our transients. The average stay at an address is under five years. The average tenure of employment is three and a half years. Look at the divorce rate. About half of all marriages end in divorce. We are discontent. And so we go looking for someone new to make us happy. Look at the prevalence of the victim mentality. So many people believe that the government or society at large owes them something. 
Look at the social unrest. Look at how litigious we are. Look at obesity and addiction. And look at the declining attention spans. Look at the high rate of turnover in churches. Do you know that the average evangelical church in America changes out one-third of its congregation every year? I'm so thankful for the two-thirds of you that stay put every year. <laughs> We're discontent when we have so many reasons to be grateful and thankful to God. It has been almost 40 years and Bono still hasn't found what he's looking for. If living in the most peaceful and prosperous country in history isn't enough to make us content, then what is the secret? Ironically, a man sitting in chains because of corrupt politicians awaiting possible execution over false charges tells us how to find contentment. Contentment, Paul says, I have found the secret. So what is the secret of contentment? Well, looking at Paul's words in Philippians 4, I find a few thoughts that I want to share with you this morning. What is the secret of contentment? A few thoughts from Philippians chapter 4. First of all, the secret of contentment is not codependence. The secret of contentment is not codependence. In Philippians, Paul writes probably the strangest thank you note ever. It reads like a no thank you note. The occasion of this whole little letter was to say thank you for the generous gift that the Philippians sent to Paul while he was in prison. You see, in Rome, food and medicine and anything else you might need didn't come with your prison accommodations. When you checked in, you didn't get a coupon for the complimentary breakfast buffet. Your family and your friends had to take care of you or you starved. The Philippians not only sent Paul money, but they sent Epaphroditus to stay there and serve Paul any way that he could. And the whole purpose of this little letter is to say thank you, but Paul waits to the very end to say it. It's not because his thanks was an afterthought, but it's because he wanted his thanks to be the very last thought that remained with them. And yet it's a very strange thank you. He says, when I received your gift, I burst into praise. But I want you to know, I would have been just fine with or without it. <laughs> Nevertheless, it was good of you to send it. <laughs> now, what kind of thank you is that? <laughs> Imagine if I sent you a note. Thank you so much for your generous $10,000 gift to phase two. Not that we needed it, <laughs> but it was good of you to send it. I will never write you a note like that. Paul might not have needed your money, but I do. <laughs> Why does Paul write this way? Well, it's not that Paul was ungrateful for their gift. It's not that their gift wasn't a big and timely blessing. It's that Paul is trying to teach his Philippian sheep an important Christian principle. Paul did not look to people as his source of help. He looked only to the Lord. Paul is trying to tell the Philippians that he had no expectations from them. He had no demands. He's trying to tell them that the basis of the friendship between them is genuine affection in the Lord and not what they can do for him. The Philippian believers owed their faith and their eternal salvation to Paul. He risked his life. He suffered to bring them the gospel. He obeyed a heavenly vision and he sailed from Turkey over to Greece and he walked along a riverbank till he found a group of God-fearing Gentile women praying to the Jewish God. He told them about Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, and the church was born. But in Philippi, Paul endured a riot, a severe beating, unlawful imprisonment in a dungeon in stocks. And yet Paul's attitude towards the Philippians was not, you owe me. Look at everything I've been through, you owe me. Look at what's happened to me, you owe me. Look at all I've done for you, you owe me. In fact, that wasn't Paul's attitude toward any of the churches he planted or towards any of his friends. 
Why are there so many people struggling with discontentment today? Well, part of the equation is that many of us have an unfair or unrealistic expectation of others. We are looking to others to meet our needs, whether external or internal, rather than looking to ourselves and especially rather than looking to God. We have an unrealistic expectation from the government, from the education system, from our employers, from our friends and family. We feel that someone owes us something and we're not going to be content until we get it. But Paul wasn't codependent on anyone. He was dependent on Christ alone and he was interdependent on his brothers and sisters in Christ. Beloved, can I tell you one thing I have learned along life's road about self-pity? This is what I've learned. Nobody really cares. They don't feel sorry for you. And if you're hoping that someone else feels guilty because of your troubles, guess what? They don't feel guilty. Somebody once said that unforgiveness is like drinking poison and hoping it will kill your enemy. Can I tell you that self-pity is precisely the same way. The only person that self-pity will control is you. What is the secret of contentment? A few thoughts from Philippians 4. The secret is not codependence. And second, the secret of contentment is not independence. Paul surely caught the attention of the Philippians when he casually claims that he has obtained the highest value of the Stoic philosophers. I have learned to be content. Whatever the circumstances, I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. For the Stoics, contentment meant to be totally independent. It meant to never rely on anybody or anything, but to rely only on oneself. To draw strength only from within oneself. For the Stoics, contentment meant emotional detachment from life. It meant to be indifferent to my surroundings and my circumstances and especially to the sufferings of others. A Stoic would never watch the television and watch those poor people walking out of that water with having lost everything but, but just the clothes on their backs or the people in shelters. You see the picture of those sweet little elderly people sitting in wheelchairs in the nursing home and the water is up to their chest. Heartbreaking. Uh, a Stoic would never sit and watch that and shed a tear and send relief. The goal of the Stoics was never to be elated and never to be deflated, but to always be unmoved. You know, there are some people who try to make their way through life on that kind of emotional autopilot. Pain in their past has pushed them to make an inner vow, whether consciously or subconsciously. No one is ever going to get to me that way again. No one is ever going to make me vulnerable again. No one is ever going to hurt me again. No one is ever going to make me cry again. Do you know we've ministered to people over the years who who have made an inner vow, whether they made it consciously or subconsciously, and they haven't been able to cry in decades. No one, I'm never going to trust a man again. I'm never going to trust a woman again. I'm never going to trust a church again. Many years ago, I had a friend whose brother was a minister in our denomination. Because of a moral failure, his brother was defrocked. And my friend made an inner vow that he would never become a member of a church in our denomination. And even though he was very active in our church for 15 or more years, he refused to take membership. Until one spring, we went on a 40-day fast. And at the end of the fast, I felt led by the Holy Spirit to have a foot washing service on Good Friday. And during that service, we stood up and did an act of identificational repentance. And on behalf of any minister or church leader or denominational official who had inflicted a wound, we begged forgiveness and then we washed feet. And the power of the Holy Spirit came down in that auditorium and broke the power of inner vows that people had made, whether they were conscious or subconscious. 
you know, the next membership class we held, we had 60 people who joined the church who had been holding out for years. The kind of contentment that Paul is talking about is not stoic independence. It's not stoic emotional isolation. Paul's words in Philippians 4 are swelling with passion and with feeling. My brothers and sisters whom I love, whom I long for, my joy, my crown, my dear friends. I burst into praise. I was renewed like the springtime. That's what the Greek words literally mean. When you showed your concern for me again, I know how how to be humiliated, and I know how to abound. These are not the words of an emotionally paralyzed stoic. These are the words of a fully alive Christian. God doesn't want, to go, want you to go through life in emotional paralysis. God wants you to feel, and he wants you to enjoy it. What is the secret of contentment? A few thoughts from Philippians 4. Uh, it, the secret is not codependence. The secret is not independence. The secret of contentment, number three, is to learn Christ dependence. Beloved, the secret of contentment is Christ. This whole little letter, it's all about Jesus. In Philippians 1, Christ is the source and the purpose of our whole life. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. In Philippians 2, Christ is the pattern after which we model our life. Have the same mindset in you as Christ Jesus who humbled himself and served and obeyed God. In Philippians 3, Christ is the goal we eagerly pursue in life and he is the prize that we win at the end of life. I want to know Christ. Yes, I want to know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made like him in his death. Not that I have obtained this already, but this one thing I do, forgetting what's behind, I press towards the goal to win the prize. What is the goal? The goal is Christ, to know Christ, to be like Christ, to be found in Christ. What is the prize for pursuing the goal of Christ? It's Christ. To receive a revelation of him on that great and final day that transforms us. Now in Philippians 4, Christ is the source of our abiding peace and he is the secret of our earthly contentment. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. I can do all things in Christ who gives me strength. The secret of contentment is to be hidden in Christ. Paul uses another word that would ring a bell with the Philippians. It's the word secret or mystery. In Paul's day, there were many secret religious societies. And only those who belonged to those secret societies knew what happened inside. It's a lot like the Freemasons or the Shriners or the Knights Templar. And this is the word Paul uses for these secret societies when he says, I know the mystery or the secret of contentment. It's not that God is hiding contentment from people. He wants everyone to know the joy of this contentment, but it can only be experienced by those who enter into Christ by faith. You know, we often talk about rising above circumstances, but last week we talked about diving below circumstances. You don't have to dive very deep into the ocean to escape the fury of waves. You only have to go 10 feet under to escape the force of a 20-foot wave. You only have to go 30 feet under to escape the force of a 60-foot wave. And that's a perfect picture of life in Christ. Paul said, we are found in him. We are hidden in him. The storms of life may billow and blow, but the destructive force just rolls over our head because we are safe below, hidden in Christ. The secret of contentment is to draw daily strength from Christ. You see, Christ just doesn't hide me from the storms of life. He gives me strength to face life. And to overcome. In Ephesians, Paul prays that we will be supernaturally strengthened inside by the Holy Spirit. We talked last week about what that looks like in Philippians 4.7. Paul says the peace of God that transcends understanding will guard your heart and mind. That word guard means a garrison of soldiers, a heavily 
armed fortress. So the peace of God is a heavily armed fortress around your heart and your mind. It's a heavenly, hev- heavily armed fortress around your emotions. It's a heavily armed fortress around your thought processes, around your decision making. Paul says, I draw that strength from Christ in any and every situation. That means I draw on him continuously. I draw on him daily. The secret of contentment is to depend on Christ all the time in the high times as well as the low times. But I want you to look at me because there's something powerful and beautiful in Paul's words and I don't want you to miss it. Paul says, I depend on Christ all all the time. I depend on him when I'm being humbled and I depend on him when I'm riding high. I depend on him when I am in need and I depend on him when I have plenty. You see, this is where we miss it so often. It is very easy to be Christ dependent when we're suffering. It is very easy to be Christ dependent when we've been laid off from our job. It's very easy to be Christ-dependent when we've received a diagnosis that has set us back on our heels. Over the years, we've had people who have always been on the fringes of our family. And in times of trouble, in times when a crisis comes up, then, then they're here pursuing the Lord. And aren't you so glad that God welcomes us? In the book of James, it says, is anyone in trouble? He should pray. Aren't you so glad that even if we've been on the fringes, when when we come to God, the psalmist said, I cried to the Lord and he heard me. But but here's where we miss it. It's very easy to be Christ dependent in those difficult times, but we tend to be very independent when we're riding high. And that's when we get into trouble. That's when that old original sin of unholy discontentment takes a hold of us and we begin to pursue more and more and more. Over the last 21 years, we've seen so many people move here with a passion for Christ and for the things of God, but as they begin to prosper, they get caught up in the whole Greenwich, Fairfield, Westchester, New York vibe. And rather than pursuing Jesus, they begin to pursue the good life with a little bit of Jesus on the side. Mm. The secret of contentment is to be content in Christ when the world throws everything it has to offer at your feet. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be his than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or land. I'd rather be held by his nail-pierced hand. The secret of contentment is to partner with Christ in everything. Beloved, the secret of contentment is not codependency, neither is it independence, and neither is it complacency. Look carefully at Paul's words here in Philippians. I can do all things through Christ. You know, sometimes we just sort of sit back and say, well, Lord, if you want it done, then you got to do it. If you want that bill out there, Lord, then then you got to do it. I'm waiting, Jesus. They that wait upon the Lord shall never exhaust their strength. But, but Paul says there is an I do involved here. I have to get up and do something, but not on my own, in partnership with Jesus. And while I'm doing what I can do, God shows up and he does what only he can do. See, that's exactly what happened with Gideon. In Judges 6.14, it says, The Lord looked at Gideon, and he said to Gideon, Go in the strength that you have. Now, if you know anything about the story of Gideon, you know there wasn't much to work with there. He was the least important member of the least important family of the least important tribe in Israel. And Gideon had a terrible fear problem. He was afraid of everyone and everything. He wasn't only afraid of the enemy, he was afraid of the people that were supposed to be on his side. There was not a lot that Gideon could do on his own 
to end the Midianite occupation of Israel, but there was a few things he could do. He could get up and serve the angel of the Lord who visited him. He could sacrifice to the Lord. He could go and sanctify his father's house and his village of all the false idols that had polluted the place. And when Gideon got up and did what he could do, God showed up and did what only God could do. In chains in a Roman prison, there wasn't a lot Paul could do. He was eager to go to Spain to preach the gospel. He couldn't do that. He was eager to strengthen the Roman church. He couldn't do that. He, he couldn't visit his churches, his other churches, and, and encourage them. But he could pray. He could write. He could minister to those who came to visit him. So Paul did what he could do, and God showed up and did what only God can do. If you want to know how we got exactly to where we're at today... It's because in 1997, Pastor Tate said to me, I want you to form a committee and find a permanent home for harvest time, a place big enough to hold a thousand people. See, I just got on that mission 20 years ago, and I refuse to let go of it. Never for a second have I ever believed that that was something that I could do in one of the most sophisticated real estate markets in the world. But never for a second did I ever doubt that it was something God could do. I couldn't do a lot, but I could do something. I could form a committee of people smarter than me. Pastor Nick was one of those and the smartest of them all. I could call realtors and start looking at commercial buildings for sale in Greenwich. When we exhausted everything that was on the market, I could write a letter, a cold call letter to properties, that owners of property that had 10 acres or more, and we could all pray over it. And when we began to do something we could do, God showed up and he did what only he could do. This property, 22 other people tried to buy this land before us. Marriott Corporation twice, the golfer Arnold Palmer and others, and 22 times the town said no. And when we showed up, they said yes. Property was listed for three million. They came down to a million and a half. A year later, they offered me six for it. You know, I think about that. On my worst days, I think about that $6 million. I could have lived in Aruba for a long time. On, I could have made it last a long time. Just kidding. <laughs> but beloved, I want to tell you, that's the way it's been this whole crazy, wild, fantastic ride. We've done what we could do. And God has shown up again and again and again. And he's done what only he could do. God opened a window in the Greenwich zoning regulations. They temporarily changed so we could get our building approved, and then they changed back again. <laughs> God made a way for us to build a $24.5 million building for $13.1 million. We still have about 500000 left to go, and I want to tell you, I can't do that, and you can't do that, but we can do something, and I promise you, if we will do the something that we can do, God will show up yet again, and he will do what only God can do. What is the secret of contentment? The secret of contentment is that contentment must be learned. Contentment doesn't come naturally to any of us. It is inherent in our sin nature to be discontent. It's inherent to be ungrateful, to be unthankful, to complain, to grumble. It is inherent to want more than what God has apportioned to us. It is inherent for us to want precisely what God has forbidden. When we come to Christ, contentment is something we learn. Paul says it twice here. I have learned. I have learned. And how is it that he learned? He learned in the school of hard knocks. Learn to see all of your life in Christ as God's classroom. 
Here's what Paul learned. He learned that God was using the whole variety of his life experiences, all of it, the good, the bad, the ugly, the times of waiting, the times of suffering and poverty, the times of success and plenty. God was using it all. You know, some subjects are harder than others, aren't they? Some units of study are harder than others. But Paul wrote to the Corinthians, all these things are working together for us to give us a far weight, greater weight of glory. See, when you're in your darkest times, just ask the Lord, Lord, what is it you want me to learn through this? And if he doesn't answer right away, and sometimes he doesn't, then just say, Lord, I don't know what you're up to, but I know it's going to be good. Amen. Learn to see all of your life in Christ as God's classroom. And learn to see life from a long-term perspective and to rejoice in every transition. Somebody once said that the only thing constant is change. And it's true. Beloved, listen to me. Life is full of transitions. Learn to enjoy what you have while you have it. And learn to let it go when it's time to let it go. One of the things, I love our little rides, taking my kids to school. We have some, some mornings we don't say much at all, but some mornings we get in the best conversations. And one of the things that I've always said to my kids over all these years is, enjoy the people who are in your life today. You, you never know how long You'll be together. You, you never know when a transition might come, when a move might come, when something might change. So just enjoy people as much as you can while you have them. Life is, is full of transitions. We mentioned to you that the words joy and rejoice appear more times in this letter than in any other New Testament letter. Something else you should know is that the word rejoice marks the transitions in this letter from one thought to the next. So every time Paul begins a new thought, every time he transitions to a new thought, it starts with rejoice. Go back and read the letter of Philippians this afternoon with that in mind and just underline every time the word rejoice appears and see that he transitions to a new thought. You know, I like that. Rejoice in the Lord in all the transitions of your life. When you pass from childhood to adolescence, rejoice. When you pass from adolescence to adulthood, rejoice. When you pass from single to married, rejoice. When you welcome new children, rejoice. When you send your babies to kindergarten, rejoice. When you send them to college while you're writing the tuition check, rejoice. <laughs> when you pass from a full house to an empty nest, rejoice. And when the kids try to come home again, bar the door. When you pass from the vibrancy of youth to the softness of middle age to the weakness of old age, rejoice. When you pass from being a top wage earner to being on a fixed income, rejoice. Rejoice. Take a long-term perspective on life and rejoice, rejoice, rejoice in every transition. What is the secret of contentment? Now, I missed a slide this morning, so if you're taking notes, don't miss this because this is my favorite part. The secret of contentment is not that I can do anything I want, but I can do everything God wants. This is good preaching right here. I'm about to preach myself happy. <laughs> the secret of contentment is not that I can do anything I want, but I can do everything that God wants. I can do all things in Christ who gives me strength has to be read within the context of this letter. What Paul does not mean is that God will help me do any old thing that comes to my mind. What it does mean is that God will help me through anything that he brings me to in his classroom. If God brings me to a pit, I can do that in Christ who gives me strength. 
If he brings me to Potiphar's house, you think you had a bad boss. If he brings me to Potiphar's house, I can do that in Christ who gives me strength. If he takes me to a prison cell, I can do that in Christ who gives me strength. If he takes me to Pharaoh's palace, I can do that in Christ who gives me strength. If he brings me to a Philippian jail, I can do that. If he brings me to a riot in Ephesus, I can do that. If he puts me in a Judean prison, I can do that in Christ who gives me strength. If he brings me to a prison ship, I can do that. If he brings me through a hurricane and a shipwreck and a snake bite, I can do that in Christ who gives me strength. If he puts me in chains in Rome, I can do that through Christ who gives me strength. I can do all things in Christ doesn't mean that I can do whatever I want. It means I can do whatever God wants. If God wants me to save my father and my 11 brothers, I can do that through Christ. If God wants me to be the apostle to the Gentiles, I can do that through Christ. If God wants me to find a permanent home for harvest time, a place big enough for a thousand people, I can do that through Christ who gives me strength. Balance my family and my career and my walk with Christ and my service to his kingdom. Yes, 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 I can do that through Christ who gives me strength. What is the secret of contentment? Finally this and we're done. Worship team, rescue me. The clock, the clock. Nobody told me, you know, there is some important information that the senior pastor should know from time to time, like that for some reason the clock is 10 minutes slow this morning on the back wall. Now, I did not know that in the first service, so I thought I had 10 minutes more than I had. So we started second service late, and now we started third service late. So come rescue me, please, worship team. <laughs> the clock is off again. Would somebody, somebody write me a little note? Hey, pastor, you have 10 minutes less than you thought. What's the secret of contentment? Finally this and we're done. The secret of contentment is to live with heavenly discontentment. Paul was chained in a Roman prison awaiting trial on capital charges before a notoriously despotic dictator. Why wasn't he anxious? Why wasn't he agitated? Why wasn't he angry? Why was Paul at peace? Why was he so overflowing with joy and hope and confidence? It wasn't because Paul was some emotionally detached stoic. It's because his heart wasn't set on earthly things at all. You see, changing circumstances on earth didn't really rock Paul because Paul was engaged in a relentless pursuit of a heavenly prize. Paul lived with a holy inward longing for more and more of Christ. For his sake, I have counted all things as loss. Yes, I have let go of all things. I have taken them out with a trash that I might gain Christ. I want to know Christ. I want to be like Christ. I want to be found in him. What was the secret of Paul's earthly contentment? It was his heavenly discontentment turn your eyes upon Jesus look full in his beautiful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace what is the secret of contentment a few thoughts from Philippians 4 not codependence not independence, but Christ dependence. Would you stand on your feet this morning and give Jesus a great big praise in this place? Come on, let's give Jesus a good praise this morning.